hey folks yo it's been a while um, since the world went topsy-turvy I just couldn't get much done I thought I bring begin this one here with a recap of the last 12 episodes and then put as much in of the remaining things that I gathered during this study on magnets navigation etc as possible Maybe I will go back to the swastika in, in the future. I still have a bunch of material to, to share. But I will see what happens. First this. Several months back, uh, as I was looking a little bit deeper at the occurrences of the swastika symbol through history, one particular piece of ceramics turned up adorned with a symbol which is considered to be a swastika by some. It is the lid of a larger ceramic bowl found as one part of grape goods on one of the Cycladic islands in the Aegean Sea, estimated to be some 5,000 years old. I wasn't very much impressed myself at first, but to make sure that this piece of ceramics was the actual piece with swastika some speak of, and Wondering if there would be any more examples other than this one, I've uh, dived into it. Uh, instead of finding swastikas on cycladic pottery, however, I have found several things that led to further research and a bit of a deviation. So in episode uh, 13, we looked at one of the hypotheses on the decorations of the lids uh, of these so-called uh, frying pans, as they are generally called by historians. And independently from each other, they concluded that these indentations represented calendars, mainly for tracking the cyclus of Venus, but also of the other planets known in archaic times. In episode 13b, we looked into the possibility of the cycladic pans filled uh, with a liquid um, to create um, the sort of a mirror of, uh, in which yeah, the reflections uh, can be used to gaze at the sky, the moon, rainbows, and then we compare them to the neuragic wells of Sardinia. We looked at the production of mirrors by Hittites and Mesoamerican cultures of the second millennium BC and touched on the camera lucida, a tool used by artists from the early Renaissance on the present day. Yeah, in thought, we go over an yet another possible use of these pans as researchers think they may have been used for salt winning. They do this by comparing these pans with objects found in the Varna region of Bulgaria, where salt was a main export product, and items found in the oldest mounds of Armorica, West Brittany, in France. To in 13 C, they returned to the lids of the, pan, of the pots and more specifically the fish ornament on the bow of the boats on some of the later vessels of the Kerosiros culture. This was a short dip into the occurrence of oculi and figureheads in different cultures to this day. Also, I mentioned trade of oars and what with that navigation comes into the picture and together with that, of course, astronomy and the lodestone. The ancient Chinese are said to be to have been the, the first ones to use magnetism for orientation, be it not to navigate the seas, but in divination and in the art of architecture, more in particular Chinese Feng Shui and Indian Vastu Shastra. Being in the Pen Indian Peninsula, I touched upon the mythology of Matsya, uh, which is Vishnu's fish avatar. And in this disguise, Manu, uh, Vishnu saves Manu after the, one of the floods from the many Vedic uh, flood myths and leads him and the seven rishis to a safe mountainside. 
from 13G on, I started looking a bit deeper at constellations, starting with Sishumara, the Forgotten One, who held up the North Star in his fishtail and relates to the dragon that inhabits our most northern sky and rules over the stars as if it were her shiny um, treasure. We look at other snakes and fish out there like Cetus, Dorado, Hydra and Hydras, Serpents and especially the Pisces Ostrinus. This uh, southern fish has the star Fumalhaut or Fumalu, uh, one of the four royal stars used by navigators who sailed the Arabian Sea in ancient times and uh, also links them to the guardian deities who see the turning in many different religions through history. Then I returned to the GNC and found a people called the Magnetis and followed the trail of Jason and the witches Medea to Circe and search for a uh, for the magical stone. And this magnetic or Heraclean stone has been in an enigma on which many natural philosophers spent many thoughts. There is uh, so much more info in those episodes than I can sum up here uh, in the summary, but, but roughly this is the road I followed so far. It is with the onset of the Iron Age where the magnetic lodestone loses a bit of its scent of magic and after that more and more, although some of its properties remain in the realm of myth and legend, or so it seems. Of course, the more archaeologists in the field make new discoveries, the more our historical achievements or the timeline of our historical achievements needs to be adjusted. Eventually, although composed with factual evidences that are uncovered, drawing history always remains a guessing game to some degree. General timelines can hardly be accurate, as some cultures had access to certain ores and developed a deep knowledge of alloys, while others still used stone axes. Some remained as specialists in their local workshops, while others developed a blooming industry with expanding trade networks. The arrow of the Scythian king mentioned by Greek historian Iamblichus confirms for me that these horse lords who ruled those old trade routes were well advanced in their metallurgy, something often discussed and contested because this knowledge seemed to conflict with their nomadic or semi-nomadic lifestyle. I figure that there is a good reason why early alchemists who were always obscuring their knowledge of techniques for the eyes of outsiders would sometimes use the term Scythian water when referring to mercury. In times long before the Scythians, there were places in those broad steppe lands from Eastern Europe to, East, to Central Asia where mining and metallurgy took place on a large scale very early in human history. Um, some may be familiar with Arkaim in Oblast Chelyabinsk, Russia, close to the Kazakhstan border. Arkaim is sometimes referred to as Fostico City, but I have found no convincing explanation for why this is the case. There are ceramics found in the area of which some do indeed have swastikas, but I am not aware of swastikas being more prominent in Arkaim than in so many other places. I mention this place because aerial survey of the area has enabled the discovery of several traces of such ancient cities as well as the presence of open mining pits. And I saw researchers' proposal of the settlements being a center of metallurgy, a, a school perhaps, with a fireplace and dunk pool and dunk pool in every separate room. And yeah, this appeals to me. 
Although unclear still, it is assumed the people who built these settlements belong to the Shintashta or Andronovo culture. Several bel belpit type mines were discovered in the near as well. Gold was abundant. And then there is to the west of that, the southern Ural mountains. That is where Malachite and Azurite were mined in a place called Kargali. For example, an estimated 2 to 5 million tons of this copper ore were dug up, dug up during the Bronze Age, starting as early as the 5th millennium. An amount ranging from 55,000 tons to double as much copper was smelted from this ore over there. So I think it is obvious extensive trade must have taken uh, place and this from very early on. Now, slowly, archaeologists start to accept that one does not need a furnace to perform metallurgy. Crucibles alone and a fire will do just fine. There is no constant loss of slag, however, making it thus much more difficult for archaeologists to trace. Then considering that nomads and semi-nomads roaming those northern regions in all probability had just as much, if not more, access to meteoric iron than the Egyptians had to swamp iron. A lodestone would be a very handy tool when looking for such magnetic ore. For those who haven't uh, seen it already, um, the uh, episode I made called the Iron Man uh, of my swastika series is worth watching on um, metallurgy. Also, I just want to highlight here that there are more minerals than just magnetite or greygite that are magnetic. Um, there are andesites and basalts. But although they do disturb the reading of a regular magnetic compass, their magnetic property cannot be compared with that of magnetite, uh, let alone uh, compare it with a lodestone zapped by lightning. But that just as a side note. The magical lodestones were long considered of great value. They were attributed a soul, not only by the natural philosophers of antiquity. This concept lasted until late in the Middle Ages. I already touched on some of the folklore in previous episodes. Also, Asian alchemists and later metallurgists gave it, gave it a high standard. It was used in the production of certain mystique idols in Central Asia and in the Indian Peninsula. At some point in Iron Age Greece, the value of lodestones equaled that of silver, and many centuries thereafter, the rich and famous who obtained such a stone would spend money and means to secure its magnetic strength. It was long thought that lodestones should be fed iron filings to augment its power. Later on, this augmentation of the magnetic power of natural lodestone was obtained by arming it. They did this by securing it between two iron poles and by suspending a weight underneath, securing its alignment with the magnetic poles of the earth. This example here supposedly belonged to Galileo, of whom it is known that he performed his own experiments with magnets. All of these scholarly types would have their own experiments, culture uh, being another example, and they often had competing ideas and hypotheses. Galileo, for example, rejected the idea of Kepler, who proposed that our star was a giant magnet and a magnetic vortex was the force driving all the planets in our solar system. Any shallow search for the nautical compass will quickly bring you to the works of William Gilbert, who was a contemporary of both Galileo and Kepler. He was a talented and privileged young physician, moved to London and via the London College of Physicians, made it as one of several bright minds at the court of Elizabeth I. 
Later in life, around 1600, William Gilbert would gain international fame with his extensive treatise on the magneto, in which he describes a series of experiments he puts onto his own contour and writes about the magnetic compass and gathers data to establish a theory on a magnetic earth. This work could not be created without the assistance of two sailors he knew since a young age. You see, Gilbert grew up in a rich coastal area close to London and was very familiar with sailing. Prior to achieving that position at uh, Elizabeth's court that I mentioned, Gilbert had spent years in the international waters working as a privateer. Now, privateers, also called corsair, were basically sailing mercenaries who hijacked uh, ships for the, so for the sovereigns they had allegiance to and who were stealing the ships and load for that sovereign's gain or for their own gain as they traded the loot at their naval outposts. Once in the hands of the enemy, privateers were considered uh, prisoners of war. This, contrary to pirates who had no such protective status, who were working for their own as uh, freebooters. These years of travel probably explain Gilbert's acquaintance with the magnetic needle, the Acus Nautica. To gather the data for his work on telluric currents, he would rely on at least two former colleague privateers from his past. These merchants had their bases high up north in the Baltic, as well as in the Mediterranean and the Azores, allowing them to gather the data of several uh, different latitudes. Such militarized ships of, mercanta of the mercantile class must have brought these men in contact with knowledge that was still unknown on land. I am reminded of Gerardus Mercator, Gerard the Merchant, famous for his maps. Portland mapping was developed by merchants. There is a bunch that can be said about the long history of such privateers or merchants like there were the Radonites and the privateers who traded precious, precious stones, spices, salt, gunpowder and black and white slaves back and forth. But that is all too much for here and now. In any case, it was such men that were the best sources for the data that allowed progress in the science of natural phenomena. Gilbert also gets credit for the discovery of the phenomena of electricity and for naming that. And yeah, it all makes me wonder how it comes that this man gets all this credit. Because about 400 years prior to Gilbert's famous treatises, one of the first sources for the nautical needle in the European literat literature was an August Augustinian monk called Neckham. And I really was a theologian with particular interests in the Qatar heresy and early physics. In his book, De, Re De Naturis Rerum, he goes into the Arcus Nautica, describing both the use of a suspended needle as of a needle pivoting on a, a stick. The use of such a compass, according to Neckham, was well known among European sailors in his time. We speak at the end of the 12th century. Neckham didn't get much honors during his time for these declarations, however, so I read. And when looking under the surface a bit deeper, I find more persons who do not get the deserved acknowledgement. Another example is the craftsman who actually create, created the first practical model of the suspended needle in a wooden pixis. All what is known is that he was one of the most talented technicians out there in those days. My guess is he lacked the privileges to make name for himself. But the way I see it, Petrus Peregrinus de Malecourt is one uh, most important individual deserving more credit. 
around 70 years after Neckham wrote on the magnetic needle used by navigators, Pietrus Peregrinus de Maharncarnia, otherwise known as Peter Pilgrim of Maricourt, writes down the oldest extant word in Europe on the properties of magnets. Apart from his letter to a friend, in which he extensively recorded all his experiments and subsequent discoveries, he left little to no traces. Peregrine is the first to observe the magnetic poles of our world, not Gilbert. He called it the Gate of Heaven and located it at True North in the Draco constellation, not in, Ursa, in the Ursa constellations. Through the years, a lot of words have been spent on whether Pere, Peter Peregrine ever existed or not. But there are passages in the writing of the 13th century theologian Roger Bacon, in which he not only mentions his name, he celebrates him because of his work. Bacon was the first to celebrate Peregrine's experimental research. This experimental method was largely, largely neglected and undervalued by the scientific world, which preferred the Aristotelian theoretical method. This Frenchman preferred to work in relative seclusion as an engineer for the armies of King Charles I of Anjou, during one of the numerous crusades sanctioned by the Vatican against the city of Lucera. Lucera, in the Apulia region of southeast Italy, served as a place of resettlement for several thousands of Saracens who were banned from the island of Sicily. Sicily had been in the hands of the Moors for nearly three centuries prior until at the end of the first millennium, uh, Christians recaptured the island. These Saracens worked for the Swabian King Frederick II, a descendant of an old Germanic house. This Frederick II has played a very important role in the documentation of all new developments regarding navigation. It all leaves the impression that this crusade may not so much have been to get rid of the Saracens in Italy, but to get rid of the Teutonic contestors of the throne of Roman Emperor. Anyways, that's another story. The years that Peter Pellegrin spent in that region, of course, make one wonder whether he managed to deepen his knowledge of magnetic properties with the help of these Lucerian Saracens. There are older indications for the use of the magnetic needle by so-called Syrian sailors in the second half of the first millennium already. So the possibility is certainly there. But these South Italian regions were the playground of not just the Arabs and Saracens, also Jews and Persian Quasirim from Khorasan settled there. And why I think this may be important is because of an other uh, early compass uh, made in the 14th century as, uh, by a 14th century astronomer and timekeeper Ibn al-Shatir from Damascus, Syria. He is credited with the invention of a compass combined with a sundial, which would be used to orientate towards the Qibla or Kaaba for praying. This sounds to me very much like one of many inventions attributed to the before-mentioned ex-privateer called Wright, one of the persons who, know, who we know assisted Gilbert with his famous treatise on the Magnete. It is no secret, of course, that many of the scientific discoveries made during the Enlightenment were adapted from Middle Eastern scientists, from regions where many scholars and the remnants of ancient scrolls found their refuge from religious prosecution. Whatever that may, also Al-Shatir's work is based on the writings of a uh, still earlier scientist called Nasir al-Din al-Tusi, a famed 12th century uh, astronomer scientist from Khorasan, more in particular from a place called Tus on the eastern shores of the Caspian Sea. 
although originating in a long-held bastion of Zoroastrianism, Altusi was a Shi'i who had to flee to the Zagros mountain range due to the deadly raids from the Mongols. So, I have highlighted earlier that the Chinese are credited with being the first to use the magnetic compass for navigation somewhere during the same time period, the 12th century AD. But we also know that it was in use at least one million millennium already by then. It was used on military campaigns to orientate during starless nights. A valuable tool, and that value would not have been public knowledge for obvious reasons. Such need for secrecy can be the cause for so many distorted histories. Flavio Gioia's story may be yet another example of that. Born sometime during the 13th century, he is credited with the improvement of the nautical compass, adding the fleur de lis to it. He is said to have worked for the King of Naples, Charles I of Anjou, just like Peter Peregrinus did. Contrary to the latter, however, there are no literary evidences for his very existence. Some claim he never did. His name would only refer to a small town, again in Af Apulia, in southern Italy. This era was very important, what the spread of new inventions is concerned. Inventions that serve trade and warfare, and with that, the expansion of empires beyond the big waters. Roger Bacon has this to say about these inventions. Again, it helps to notice the, the force, power and consequences of discoveries which appear at their clearest and treatings that were unknown to antiquity and whose origins, though recent, are obscure and unsung, namely the art of printing, gunpowder and the nautical compass. In fact, these three things have changed the face and conditions of things all over the globe. The first in literature, the second in the art of war, and the third in navigation, and innumerable changes have followed, so that no empire or sect or star seems to have exercised a greater power and influence on human affairs than those mechanical things. I have my suspicions that a man like Archimedes, for example, with everything he invented, never understood the real technical value of a lodestone, not even that such a stone had both an attracting and repelling side, mm -hmm. two forces within one. Uh, it was not for the commoner to learn the secret arms of the military officers, nor was it his fate to become a practitioner of geomancy, just like it has always been a means of progress for a certain elite who sought to conquer seas and territory. This caste or class both had much secrets to protect. A magnetic stone, arrow or needle would be a perfect tool, an unfallible guide to power and riches, be it as a lead to ores or to the central stars. After this long series that started with some hundred or so third millennium ceramics found on some of the Cycladic islands, after looking at leading stars and digging up legends almost gone, I can easily tie it all back to the initial propositions, that of the astronomical observation tool or the tool for navigation. I at some time had the audacity to challenge myself with a quest for the real history of magnets and compass, which is a silly thing really, because yeah, it would take years of study and speculation to be able to do that, knowing there will never be any conclusive evidence or proof. Yes, same for the true origins and history of the swastika, but I do choose to return to that one instead 
this additional search for the history of magnets has taken me far enough of my goal as it is. With all the ugliness that is now going on in the world as well as on the net, I am not sure if I will ever follow through, if I will make more videos soon. I frankly have doubts if, if it is all worth the effort. Big thanks anyway for all who have given me support in the past. I, I really don't think I would have gotten this far without your affirmations. Thank you for watching, for the comments and the likes. I wish you all well. Bye-bye.